I like the story you told me about how the Tokoyama, the hairdresser, knows who's going to be next to retire. Well, that's right, because the uh, some of the guys have really luxuriant hair. Some of them have so little hair that one poor fellow's sponsor for his Kesho Mawashi was a, a hair replacement clinic, <laughs> which was a wee bit embarrassing. But some of them have really a lot of hair. And so to make it sit nicely when they do the oicho, the um, ginkgo leaf style, they actually shave the middle of the head like a tonsure. Mm. And so when the guy's going to retire, he doesn't want him his head to be shaved. He wants his hair to grow out long enough that when he actually has the, the mugget cut, he doesn't have a bald patch in the middle. Dang. So it's like uh, there was an old advertisement for dye, I think. It was only your hairdresser knows for sure whether your hair is dyed or not. <laughs> But in, in this case, it's you're, only the barber knows for sure whether you're planning to retire. Mm -hmm. right. um, yeah, well, the barbers are really interesting guys to talk to. Um, the sumo world is fascinating because um, it's, it's, it's a closed society and they have specific roles. And to think that there are, I don't know how many barbers there are now, but there's some guys whose whole life is just dedicated to doing the hair of the rikshi. Aye. And the gyoji with their various jobs and on the ring and keeping the records and writing the bansuke and so on. And the yobidashis are doing the, calling the names and what have you, but they're also building the dohyo. It's a very intricate, intricately woven society where people know their place. And because yep. they do, it all works together. Katrina, you have had obviously so many years involved in the sumo world. So many rikishi you have seen come and go and had relationships with and friendships with. So obviously you have been around to see many wrestlers who are now maybe top rankers as juniors when they were coming up through the ranks. And, and you had mentioned a couple of things to me that I'm just, I just know that our audience is going to love to hear about. So... Um, I would love to ask you, you had mentioned something to me, how you, um, by phone, had to save Tochi Notion and Gagamaru when they travelled um, to Japan to represent Georgia. Um, I would love for you to share that story, if you don't mind. Well, Tochi Notion and Gagamaru came by themselves from Georgia. Mm -hmm. and the competition was in Osaka, but they were going first to Narita Airport where they were to be met by somebody from the Nihon Sumo, the Nihon University Sumo Club. Anyway, uh, I was at my university and suddenly the phone's ringing. It's the International Sumo Federation. They're saying, oh, you know, we can't find these guys, but uh, they're somewhere at the airport. And we, we've had a, a phone call from the information um, desk there. They've got these guys but they don't, and nobody speaks Russian. And so, so will you call? So I was given the number for the information desk at Narita mm. airport. Mm. And I had to ring them up and say, uh, do you have these two guys from Georgia there? Yes. And Tochinoshin didn't speak Russian, but Gagamaru did. He, mm. He'd learned it at school. And so I spoke to Gagamaru and I'm saying, now uh, you had to stay exactly where you are please put me back. Someone is coming to meet you. Don't move. Please put me back to the lady at the information desk. And then I said, now, which information desk at Narita Airport are you? Because it's huge. Mm. So I got the exact, no, just wait there. So then I hang up and I ring up the International Sumo Federation. I said, they're in front of information desk, blah, 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 blah. And so they said, well, okay, tell them to wait. Somebody's coming. So ringing back again and tell them, don't worry, I'm sending someone. So they, they, they were found and that was fine. And they went to the competition and they were so grateful because they, of course, they were in a panic. They're like 15 and they're in a foreign Bye. country and they don't speak the language. So then um, after the competition was finished on the Monday morning, I was getting ready to go back to work. And the, they say to me from the, the International Sumo Fresh, oh, Katrina, please take them to Osaka Airport and put them on the plane to, to go to Tokyo because they were actually going to go to Nihon University to uh, train there for a little while. 
And I'm thinking, I've got to go to work. And he went, of course. So off we went to the airport and I shepherded them along and I made right. sure they at least went through. Uh, I couldn't go through the um, security check, but I got them through, you know, gate number, whatever mm -hmm. it was, going to get on the plane. Right. Well, after that, of course, I was like their, their I don't know, their auntie. I, and they, of course. they always treated me like their the family member, which was, which was lovely for me. I that that that, that yeah. would have been that that's that was honestly lovely. And here's the thing, but you actually did save them because well, yeah. that was just a whole mess and confusion, and it that could have went in so many directions, especially with the amount of information deaths and just the whole kerfuffle. They were the the uh, international sumo federation was lucky to have you there at the time. I think because oh, well, I, I don't I think they would have sorted know. it without you. Do you know what I mean? But I, I was very happy about it. I remember with my sister and brother-in-law, we were going to see the, the sumo in Nagoya. And we were walking along and the, the rickshaw going through the back and a, mm -hmm. a taxi pulled up and uh, we were paying attention. And the next thing, it's Tochi no Shin leaping out of the taxi and running up to Katarina and give me the biggest hug. And, and my family thinking, oh, okay, maybe she does have some position here in sumo. Aye. She doesn't talk. Aye. I know. Yeah, they, sound, they sound like newborn baby animals that think the first size, the first person they lay eyes on is their mother. <laughs> <laughs> that is in well, that was the funny thing that happened with Kokai, because um, I, I went to the um, Tatsunami Bear to meet him, and I had my little Russian phrase book uh, and saying, Minya, um, Savut, Katrin. Uh, and, and I showed him a picture of the Georgian uh, sumo champion. And I said, Ya Ilevan Tovarich. Oh, he cracked up laughing. I, well, I learned that in the James Bond movies, but I didn't realize that Tovarich didn't mean friend. It actually meant your communist comrade. So anyway, we had a good laugh. And then um, he was going to do his first match of sumo. In, it was in Nagoya. So I went round the back where they were waiting to, to wish him luck. Well, of course, he didn't speak Japanese, and so I was talking to him in Russian. And there were some uh, young Mongolian guys having their first uh, sumo in the Maezumo at the same time. And they could speak Russian because a lot of Mongolians learn Russian at school, the way mm. we might learn yep. French or German or something. Yep. And so they heard me there, and I'm saying, oh, yes, do your best. And you know, blah, blah, and don't be, don't be shy or whatever. I can't remember what I said to him, but they were convinced that I was Kokai's mother <laughs> because what other, you know, foreign lady would be there talking to him in Russian. And then uh, for years afterwards, a certain uh, era of young Mongolians, whenever they saw me in the, in the sumo, whatever the Kokugikan or the Nagoya or Fukuoka, they would come up and bow deeply and greet me in Russian, much to the surprise of every, you know, the other, like, what's going on with you? But people in the street later also said to me, are you Kokai's mother? So maybe we, we looked a bit similar, but I would have been... Just run friendly. with it. <laughs> Did you yeah. tell me you said I? You just said I, Kosama? Yep. Of course, yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. He's a good boy, I'd say. You're trying now. And he was so unlucky. When he, he won, I think, the Jonokuchi, and the, of course he couldn't speak um, Japanese very well, but he had an interview on the NHK, and they asked him, you know, how do you feel, and oh, is she happy? And then they said, Akogare no rikshi wa dare desu ka? Who is the rikshi that you admire and you know, uh, aspire to? Of course, he had no idea what that meant. So that the guy rephrased it and, and uh, I've forgotten who he said, somebody in his hair, he, he, he said. So the next time when he won the Johnny Dan, uh, they asked him a similar question and he answered, the, quickly answered the name of his Akogare no Rikshi, but they were actually asking him something else. So I felt so sorry for him because, you know, how how tense is it trying to do an interview in a foreign language and you mm. think oh, i've got this one nailed but it was not the right thing I, I, oh, that. Because this reminds me of another funny story because the day that we went to meet kokai um 
the oyakata at the uh, at the hair um, was very. He was always very friendly, and I'm sorry, was it the Tatsunami bear? Oitekaze. Oitekaze bear. Thank you very much. So Oitekaze oyakata, who had been in the Tatsunami bear when he was an active rikshi, um, he said, "Oh, would you like an ice cream?" And it was like eight o'clock, seven o'clock, or eight o'clock in the morning, and it was cold. And we said, "Oh." No, thank you. No, not, not just now. He said, oh, the sponsor gave us a whole lot of ice cream. Kokka, get an ice cream for them. So Kokka is wearing a mawashi and he makes him delve into the freezer to get the ice cream. So <laughs> then he pulls out, you know, we're thinking, oh, yeah, an ice cream on a stick. Maybe we can you know, force ourselves. To no, it was a big tub of ice cream, like a two litre tub of ice cream. And we said, oh, oh, kata. No, no, you know, we, we, we can't eat that. We're, we're going to the sumo now. And he said, oh, that's okay. You can eat it in the masuseki. We said, but we don't have anything to eat. We said, oh, you can get some chopsticks. Oh, yeah? We're going to sit in the masuseki. Uh, four ladies with a two-liter tub of ice cream eating it with chopsticks. <laughs> anyway, of course, we didn't want to waste it. So the, the member of the group who lived closer <laughs> had to take the detour and take the ice cream home before she could come and join us at the, at the sumo. Oh, oh, that's brilliant. I can't believe he recommended that you use chopsticks for ice cream. That's too funny. <laughs> that is too funny. You know what I mean? Uh, you just end up mixing it into soup, trying to pack a bat up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, oh, brilliant. Well... Honestly, like I, I think that my last question is going to get you to ask you about the first Mongolians, and just like a wee bit experience. Like, um, I know that you had just mentioned them, and um, obviously they would bow deep. You thought you were Kokai's mum, um, but just if you could just give us a wee, because I take it you had a, a, a friendship with some of them. Oh, right. Um, well, of course, it wasn't the, the very first Mongolians who were there, a contemporary with Kokkai. That was much later. Mm. But I was lucky that the, the six Mongolians who first came into Sumo to the Oshima Bear, it was in Osaka. And so I, because I lived in Osaka, I used to go to lots of hair for watching the cake and so on. So we were there and there were the six guys and they had a Mongolian interpreter at the time. And we saw them there and, and uh, took pictures and um, watched them. And then later we went back again to give them the pictures. And they were very excited because they said, oh, we can send these to our family. And they were really happy. Now, I went there with um, my Japanese friend, Miyoko, and my um, African-American friend, Jinan, who was very tall and looked like Grace Jones. Mm. And myself with the long hair. So we were kind of a recognizable trio. So then we were at the, at the stadium in Osaka when they had the, the introducing the new recruits, the Shin Deshi, Deshi Shusehiro. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in front of us was a Kyokuten Hall. And I think it was Kyokutenzan. And they didn't know anybody in Japan, but they look out and there, sitting quite close to the front, are those three ladies that they've met twice at the hair. And, oh, they're our friends. So they're standing there. And they start to, one of them waves. And then he nudges the other one. And he starts waving. So there they are. And they're you know, <laughs> being introduced. And then they're waving and smiling. And my Japanese friends is going, no, no, stop it. And they're waving even more. So that was that was a lovely experience for us. <laughs> but that was what they what they would whoever was running the show must have been pulling his hair out. I they did get they did get a proper bollocking for that after it. They may well have been told Aye. that that wasn't the way to behave, but uh, understandable, I think. I definitely. Yeah, so I was lucky to meet those guys quite early on, and um, of course we stayed friends ever after right. and they were so cute they were trying to learn Japanese and the second time we went along there um, where they were training was in a kind of tent and so they were being led along the street to the bathhouse by a senior rikshi who was teaching them Japanese by singing uh, Japanese children's songs and he was singing pop pop 
well, hop, 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 which is like uh, the pigeon is, uh, I don't know what the pigeon's doing, hopping or cooing or something. Right. But he was leading along and these six boys were going along repeating this pigeon song as they went down the street. It was rather charming. <laughs> that does sound, that sounds hilarious. Absolutely yeah. hilarious.